Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here on this special Earth Day edition of Conservation in the Classroom. My name is Kate, and I will be your host today. And I am thrilled to have our featured presenter here with us. Her name is Eve Downing. Eve is currently an undergraduate student at Northwestern University in Chicago. But she is originally from Alaska, where she first became passionate about spreading awareness of some of the critical changes that were happening to the environment all around her. So today she's here with us to share a bit about what she did to make a difference and offer some advice as to what you all can do within your own communities to make an impact as well. So Eve, thank you so much for being here. If you can just hop on and say hi to everybody just before we get started. Hi, everybody. I am super excited to tell you a little bit about Living Alaska and what I do and, and hearing some of your questions later on. Awesome. So before I officially pass things over to Eve, I just want to take a moment to remind those of you that are watching live on the website to use the form that you see underneath the video there to place any questions that you have for Eve throughout her presentation. We will get to as many of those as we can at the end during the Q&A portion of the program. Next, I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce our very special guests that we have joining us on camera today. So as soon as you hear your names, make sure to unmute your microphone and give everyone a big hello. So first up, joining us from her home in Alexandria, Virginia, we have Noor. Hi, Noor. Hi. Happy to have you here. Um, next up, we have Team Vision and Team Perseverance from Franklin Elementary in West Allis, Wisconsin. What's up, everybody? There they are. Okay. <laughs> um, next, joining us from Littleton, Colorado, we have Miss Van Hoy's third graders. Guys, are you there? Make sure you're unmuted. <laughs> nice and loud. Give us a give us a shout. There you are. <laughs> and last but not least. Oh, there we go. Just a little delayed. They're there. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Miss Monty's fifth grade class at Carrollwood Day School in Tampa, Florida. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. That was wonderful. So great to have everybody here. Without further ado, Eve, if you are ready, the floor is yours. You can go ahead and take it away. Okay, perfect. Let me share my presentation here. Hi, everybody. Um, so as she said, my name is Eve, and um, I'm really excited to talk to you guys about being environmental advocates today. So first, a little bit about Alaska. I am from South Central uh, Alaska, which is right here, um, and which is also called the Kenai Peninsula, is that the little off hang there. Uh, but Alaska is super big, so it's really hard uh, to talk about all Alaska. So I'm just going to focus on my little part. Um, so growing up in Alaska, it has been um, really interesting and really fun. I spent a lot of time hiking and biking and kayaking. Um, here's a picture of, of my family backpacking, which if you don't know what backpacking it is, it's where you take all your things, you bring a tent and food and you pack it all up in big huge backpacks and you hike up somewhere um, and you stay there for a couple days you camp out there um, and it's really interesting because a lot of places in Alaska where you backpack there's no cell service so you're completely cut off uh, for a couple days no you can't text people you can't look things up um, and so it's it's a pretty interesting experience um, some like kind of fun facts about Alaska um, in summer there can be um, like sunlight for 19 hours, which means one, I'm really good at sleeping with like the lights on and sleeping with light out, but it means that summer days feel super long and you feel like you have forever to do all the things you wanna do. Um, there's also over 3 million lakes in Alaska. Um, and another fact is there's approximately one bear for every 21 people in Alaska. I learned that pretty recently actually. Um, here's just some photos of wildlife in Alaska. These moose are, we have moose that come by my house pretty often. They like to hang around and um, circle back every few weeks. Um, there's some different moose that do that. I hear some 
bear and uh, a mountain goat up on a hike I did this past summer. And so you see actually a lot of wildlife very frequently um, because our little town is like just surrounded by um, the wilderness. Um, winter in Alaska is also very interesting. Um, lots of skiing, lots of snowshoeing, and kind of the opposite problem in the summer is that it gets dark very early and um, doesn't get light until later in the day. So a lot of times I would leave for school and it'd be dark and I'd come home from school and it would also be dark. Um, so it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, one thing that another thing that's really interesting about Alaska is there are a bunch of different biomes. If you play Minecraft, as my little brother does, um, you know what biomes are. They're just different um, general ecosystems with different plants and animals and, and ways that things interact. Um, so you have alpine tundra, arctic tundra, um, shrubland, boreal forest, and coastal rainforest. So you can travel not too far um, and get into a completely different area and it feels like you're in a completely different place. Um, so it's pretty fun to travel around. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, the changes that I saw, started to see in Alaska. Um, when you spend a lot of time outside and most of the things you do um, are about being outside, you tend to you notice things, these things a little bit more. Um, and so one thing is um, temperature increase. Um, and so it would, it snows a little later, it seems each year and it melts uh, a little earlier. And one way I, I, one way I could really see this is pretty interesting. In Alaska, where I live, um, especially when I was younger for Halloween, it would, um, it gets pretty cold and often there'd be a little bit of snow. And so people have to make their Halloween costumes fit over snow pants and snow gear uh, because it's so cold. But lately um, there hasn't been snow on Halloween um, because it's snowing later. Um, you also have glacier retreat. There's a lot of glaciers in Alaska and the glacier retreat happens because um, it's not, it's losing more ice in the summer than it's gaining back in the winter. And so you're seeing slow uh, glacier retreat. Actually, it's not that slow. Um, an increase in wildfires because of um, just, it's drier because of higher temperatures. And there's also some shift in what vegetation is in different places. Um, and you also see partially because of this um, insect outbreaks, so beetle kill, which are beetles that um, basically attach to trees and kill trees. So you see like big areas where trees have died. And you also have coastal erosion that happens on the coast of Alaska. Um, here's actually me with my little brother in a mushroom. And you kind of see like vegetation changes and different plants are in different places. And also this picture of me with a fish, a cleaning of fish. Um, and we also have less fish coming, um, uh, less salmon, um, largely because of warmer temperatures and some other things as well. Um, so now that I've talked about all the, um, the <laughs> not so great things, uh, let's talk about how we can do things about it. So um, some things that I do, um, I joined an organization called Alaska Youth for Environmental Action when I was a sophomore in high school. And that's when I started getting really, really involved in trying to take action and do things in my community and in the state. Um, and so one of the things that I do is bring attention to the issues. Um, and so here's uh, from different events of in bringing, you know, having posters and parades or just on the side of the road, trying to raise, raise awareness because um, one of the things here is Pebble Mine. We were trying to make sure people knew that um, they were trying to have Pebble Mine in place, which would be the largest mine in North America, if it happened, uh, would be a gold and copper mine. But the reason why it wouldn't be great for Alaska is because of the size and the location. Um, it's very likely to pollute Bristol Bay, which has one of the biggest salmon fisheries and the salmon population um, in the world. And that'd be really terrible for people living here um, and for the ecosystem. And so bringing attention to the issues with posters um, and with signs are great because you often can get people thinking about it and then hopefully they'll reach out to the representative or talk to other um, people that they know about this issue that's, that's happening in, the, in our state. Um, and so the, another thing that you can do or that I do um, is advocating for community projects. Um, and so in my community, with the help of many other people and local environmental nonprofits, some things that we work on, uh, have worked on is community compost, which is where people bring in their food waste 
um, to a, a, a central location uh, so that it can be made into compost because food waste, when it's, you just throw it away, um, it gets into landfill, it's put in an anaerobic environment, which means it will release methane, which is um, a, a greenhouse gas that's even more potent than carbon dioxide is. And so if you compost it, then um, that doesn't happen because um, it's exposed to oxygen and it's great for farms and it's great for works as a fertilizer as well. Um, and so some other things are like community solar. So getting more people um, to use solar uh, energy or in, and install solar panels and um, also recycling electronics. So they don't go into landfills. And I have a bunch of pictures of, or a couple of pictures of peop a bunch of people because a key part in all of this is working with other people and talking to others and getting their support because um, your efforts will be so much stronger if you're able to work with others. Um, another thing that I do um, is supporting environmental legislation. And if you don't know, legislation is just when a government, it can be the federal government or a state government or um, a city council, or even like your student government. Um, they have an idea that they want, they think should be a law and you propose it in a bill. Um, and then people typically talk are for or against it. Um, and so some things that I do to either try and push forward things that I support or um, raise awareness for things I think are bad ideas is public testimony. So this bottom photo here is I was at the state capitol with, um, as you can see again, a bunch of other youth, it's really important to work together, um, talking about some budget cuts that were put in place for education. Um, and then um, actually talking to representatives. So this top left photo is me again with a bunch of other people talking to Senator Murkowski in um, Washington DC about Pebble Mine and about the dangers that we thought it presented. Um, and another thing you can do is talking to reporters to bring or, or talking to like newspapers and media um, about these issues um, or writer, writing letters to the editor, which is to your local newspaper typically bringing attention to these things. Um, and so that's just some of the things that I do to try and, you know, create the environment and the future that I want for my community and my state. Um, and so now onto some things that you can do to advocate for the environment. So for bringing attention to the issues, um, making posters around school is one of the things you can do, it can be about how to recycle um, or about climate change itself and what that really is. Um, it could be about invasive species in your area or about energy use, like a poster to shut off the I'll shut off lights when you leave room, leave the room, things like that. Um, other, another really key thing is just talking to people. I think a lot of times people really underestimate the power of just having conversations with people and telling them about things that you're passionate about and things that you care about. Um, a lot of times, I think youth in particular tend to underestimate how much representatives, is that like a state representative or a city council representative or your principal or teacher. Um, they really wanna hear from kids and from youth because if you care about something and you care enough to reach out, then it's probably really important. Um, and so talking to them, talking to your friends and family and teachers is a really great way to um, get things happening. Uh, all these, a grand majority of these people here in this photo um, were there because they had friends who were passionate, who invited them along and asked them to take part in, in this, um, I think it was parade at the time. And then there's also just um, environmental friendly choices that you can do and projects that you can have in your school. So reducing water usage, train flights, carpooling with friends. I was just a little different because of COVID now, but I'll also say, I think carpooling with friends is a little more fun anyway. I have a lot of fun when I do that. Um, and doing things like using reusable water bottles. Um, there's also different, here's just a couple ideas for community projects. Um, and so having things like a beach, a community or river cleanup, um, having composting at your school, having school or community garden, um, having like a tree planting event or having a letter writing um, session with you and your friends or you and your classmates about things you're passionate about that you want um, people in your community to care about. Um, and so I'm just gonna here quickly talk a little bit about what I'm doing right now. Um, so as she said, I'm at Northwestern University, which is 
just outside of Chicago. I'm focusing on studying environmental studies, um, but I'm also an Arctic Youth Ambassador, which is a group of youth who are really passionate about bringing attention to um, issues that are affecting the Arctic. And so we do that by, again, talking with other people, um, creating um, media, uh, so either it's, it could be posters or it could be stories, um, video interviews, things like that, to um, really bring to light some of the things that are affecting people in Alaska. Um, I'm also part of a couple different environmental clubs on campus, um, and I'm really passionate about community-based solutions um, because it's, I think a lot of times people um, will focus on like the um, federal government and even the state government, but there's like a lot of power in um, just a small group of passionate people in one community um, working together and, and coming up with something that works for them. And I think it's, it's really great and um, is a really great way to uh, really be able to have, see the impact that you have. Um, and I think that's all for now. I really wanna hear what questions that you have. Um, and I'm, I'm just really excited to hear some of your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eve. We are going to get started with the Q&A now. So just a reminder to all of you that are watching on the webpage, make sure to use that Google form to place any questions that you have for Eve. Um, and we will weave those in during the Q&A here. And those of you that are on camera, make sure when it's your turn to ask a question, to unmute your microphone and speak nice and loudly for us. So we're gonna start with our groups on camera and we'll go in the same order that they were introduced. So Noor, you're up first, if you wanna unmute your microphone and ask Eve your first question. Hi Eve, I have a really good question. What is your vision for a better future and how are you going to make that future happen? That is a really great question, or a really great um, question, yeah. I, um, when I think of a better future, I think of um, renewable energy and a regenerative economy. And, and so um, using energy in a way that um, is, that we'll be able to do for a very, very long time. Um, and so that, that's very broad in terms of like specific things. Um, there are, are specific things for Alaska. And so one thing in Alaska I'm really excited for uh, and one I have is like green banks, um, which will allow more communities to have renewable energy that's specific for their communities. And so that they can be self-reliant um, on a, a, while using renewable energy. Um, right now, what I'm doing to try and like achieve a better future um, is working with other individuals trying to um, get green banks happening in, in um, Alaska specifically, but I'm also part of different groups um, at my university that are working to um, push our university away from supporting fossil fuels and investing in renewable energy. Um, because when you get really big universities and you get big organizations shifting away from fossil fuels and into renewables, that's when you really will start to see a change. Um, and hopefully uh, more progress will follow after that. Okay, great. Next up is our group from Franklin Elementary. If you guys are ready, go ahead, unmute yourselves and nice and loud for us. Yep, you can come up here, Bria. I have a question. How many endangered animals live there? I don't know um, an exact number of how many endangered animals live in Alaska, but I do know that um, because of shifting, because of um, climate change and things that are happening in Alaska, um, a lot of times species are being pushed into smaller and smaller areas where they can survive. And so because of that, more and more um, animals are being pushed um, towards uh, just basically having less resources. And so a lot of animal populations are lowering. Um, but I don't have an exact number of how many species are endangered in Alaska. Okay, let's go to Miss Van Hoy's group. You guys are up next. What's your first question for Eve?
Make sure you're unmuted. Miss Van Hoy, if you're ready. Um, if, um, if you Make sure you're unmuted. Miss Van Hoy, if you're ready. If you could bring back one extinct um, animal, which one back. would you bring back? Um, if you Make could sure bring you're back. unmuted. Miss Van Hoy, if you're ready. If you could bring back one extinct um, animal, which one would you bring back? Um, yeah, there was there was some um, uh, feedback there. Um, oh gosh, that is a really good question. That that's like very hard to pick. Um, I don't know. Recently, uh, this is in Alaska specific, but I was reading about these giant tortoises that went extinct. And I think it would be really, really cool to be able to see these like, insanely large tortoises just going around. Um, and I think they're really neat. Um, but yeah. That was a good question. Um, okay, Miss Monty's class, you guys are up next. So again, make sure nice and loud right in front of the camera for us. Who should we contact to find out how we can help wildlife in our, in our local community? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, depending on where you're at, there's a couple different um, people that you can contact. If you have like, a, like I have, there's a wildlife refuge near where I, I'm at that has a lot of great resources, but likely if you have um, like a community center, they'll have some information about um, wildlife in the area. If you have any sort of um, national park, um, or, or um, wildlife area nearby, there's likely um, people who maintain the area who you can contact. Um, but in terms of uh, like just looking things up, um, there's, if you're looking at your, like a borough, you can likely contact um, people who work at your, at your borough um, area and just call like a general line and ask like, who can I talk to? Um, because a lot, sometimes you have to do some hopping around um but i i think it really depends where you're at but i, I think those were the like some good places to start okay we're gonna take a few that came through the website and then we'll go back and do another round with our on-camera groups here so isabel in california wanted to know eve what do you think is the most important reason to protect the environment well <laughs> I think, I think there's a lot of reasons. Um, I think one is that, you know, it's, it's beautiful and amazing, but, but one that's like, will convince a lot of people. And that's great is that the environment really is beneficial for, for us too. And, and really helps us, um, having, you know, like trees, they clean the air for us and they make it breathable. And so if you're talking to people and they're not so convinced about, well, why, why should we, you know, really why should we invest a lot of time and and money into this and, and say well it's actually having wilderness and having nature um that that we haven't cut down having forests um it, it does a lot for us um having these these different ecosystems it creates clean water for us to drink um it creates clean air um that we can breathe um and also it's just really good for you to be able to go out and and be in nature um, and, and yeah, I don't know. I just think it's, it's, it's underestimated how much, um, nature and wilderness does for us, I think. So it's kind of like, you're not just advocating for the environment, you're advocating for yourself and people too. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. We also have a question here from Liz all the way in Austria, who wants to know how long have you been an advocate for the environment? When did you start? So how old were you when your first parade you marched in or poster you made or whatever you did first? Um, well, I, when I actually was kind of funny, my birthday, my birthday is actually tomorrow. And so it's always really close to Earth Day. Um, and oh gosh, I'm trying to remember when it was. I think it was when I was six or seven, we had one of my kind of themed birthday was um, kind of like a, a cleanup recycling themed birthday. So we had recycling t-shirts that had big recycling logo on them and we had a had a 
um, you know, lots of fun. But I think I started getting really, really invested and really focused on it when I was a sophomore in high school, when I was introduced into this organization. Um, but a lot of people in there were way younger than me um, and started really early. And so like, you guys are amazing and getting started this early is amazing. And the power you guys have to like make change in your communities is, is, is incredible. Well, happy early birthday, first of all. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, let's go back to our on-camera groups here. So we'll start back up with Nor and go in the same order. So if you're ready, go ahead, unmute yourself, Nor. I, I want to know what steps did you take? And if I were to do it, how would you tell me to do it? Um, I guess, I guess it depends um, what you're trying to do. But the first, one of the first things that I did um, after joining this organization um, was have a petition. And what we did is we, we all had this petition. We went to communities and um, it, I, I believe it was for the very first thing I did was trying to reduce emissions um, in the state of Alaska and trying to set up some guidelines for reducing emissions. Um, and so what we did is we went around and um, got uh, signatures and we got letters of support from different people. And then we went and contacted um, the people in our government that we need to talk to about it. And so it, it's it's kind of difficult, um, but if you have an issue that you're really passionate about that like is at the state level, then um, one, talk to your representative um, or your like senator at the state level, or if it's at the city council, you'll also have like a representative for your area. Um, talk to them about what you're passionate about um, and also talk to other people and get other people with you. Um, because having a big group is often much more powerful and you're saying, oh, look, there's all these people that are really passionate and um, we're your constituents, so you should listen to us. Um, but I guess I would need to know more about what you wanted to do if I could, if you wanted like some, oh, here's some steps you can take. Okay, that's great. Um, let's go back to our group from Wisconsin here, Team Vision and Team Perseverance, if you're ready. Are there, oh. Are there certain bags you can have? Because I saw a picture that said banned bags with a plastic bag. Oh yeah, we had, um, this is another thing I did with that same organization. Um, so did you say, uh, like, are there, did you have a bag ban? Or did oh, you say our bags? Is there a certain type of bag that you can have, like for groceries? Oh, yeah. Um, well, one, I think, like, if you're able to have a reusable bag, that's really great. Like, um, it's different because of COVID now. But before, I'd have a couple different, like, reusable bags that I bring in there. Um, and then I know that our uh, grocery store, in response, uses um, cardboard bags now because they, um, they will deteriorate, whereas plastic bags will just like stay plastic bags for a very, very long time. And so in my community, that's what we switched to was those cardboard bags um, or the paper bags. Um, but even better is using just bringing in a reusable bag. Um, or if you've just got a couple of things, don't even get a bag, just um, take your seat and, and walk out too. Okay, let's go to Miss Van Hoy's class. Hopefully the feedback won't be too bad this time. Um, I'll go ahead and mute and you guys can unmute and see how this goes. Okay, I think we should be okay. What is your favorite part of your job? Um, well, I found it, with all my environmental stuff, my favorite thing is talking to people. I love talking to people, even people that, and there are plenty of people that disagree with me, um, especially where I live, um, but I love talking to people and getting to know why they care about the things they care about and um, what they wanna do and, and, and what they're passionate about. Um, it's really great to be able to learn from other people. Um, and I've always, that's always been like one of my favorite things. Okay, last but not least, our group from Florida here, Miss Monty's class. Uh, if you're ready, go ahead, unmute. 
what is one of the most important things we can do to help wildlife in Florida? Wildlife in Florida. That's a great question. Um, I'm trying to think wildlife in Florida. I, I don't know a lot about um, ecosystems in Florida, but I think like the same general things apply, um, like trying to reduce your water usage, trying to reduce um, your waste, your food waste, and like throwing things away, um, reducing your energy usage. Um, and I'm also sure having like community cleanups um, in, your, in your area um, so that wildlife aren't eating aren't eating trash because that can be very dangerous for wildlife as well that would be that could be a really great thing to do um but yeah I think kind of just in general one of the best things you can do is just reducing your energy usage in whatever way you can if that's shutting off lights or turning off the water when you brush your teeth Okay, we're going to hop back and take a couple more from the website here. We have one from Emory in Colorado that was curious, why is there no cell service in Alaska? Um, well, uh, yeah, Alaska is very, very big. Um, and there's also just areas that are really mountainous. Um, and so because of the mountains in the area and the largest of Alaska, there's just um, areas where you don't have, uh, where the signals just don't reach. But sometimes if you are on a hike and you hike all the way up to the top of the mountain, you'll be able to get um, signal very up, all the way up at the top. <laughs> so you just have to get all the way to the top to be able to use your cell phone. Awesome. <laughs> Okay, um, Miss Michelle in Florida was curious if you could talk a little bit more about Green Bank that you mentioned. So what does that look like? What is a Green Bank? Is it um, a type or a way to store energy or share energy? What is it? Yeah, of course, that's, that's a great question. Um, so Green Banks are all about trying to get um, private private companies and uh, private uh, players in a state to be the ones to invest in clean energy and be the ones to be producing um, renewable energy if that's like producing the infrastructure or building the infrastructure. And so basically it, it's kind of like a bank that's um, focused on funding clean energy and having um, very low interest loans for clean energy and renewable energy specifically. And so it's um, thinking about ways that either like regardless of what your state government or federal government is doing that there will be private investment in it in renewable energy gotcha okay um we have uh, about 10 minutes left here so we're just going to do another round with our on-camera group so nor we'll kick it over to you um this might be your last question based on timing so make it a good one <laughs> I want to be an animal activist like you. How can I be like you? And how can I do the steps that you? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I, one, I think it's like, it's so difficult to just do it on your own and not having people support you. So if I suggest, and this is kind of what I did, looking up um, local environmental groups in your area, there may even be a, a youth environmental group um, but oftentimes there's, or it may be statewide as well, um, trying to get in contact with them and saying, hey, I'm really passionate. I want to advocate for, um, you know, animal wildlife in my area. I'm really, I really care about this. Um, and they will likely help you out and give you resources, tell you about issues that are specific to your state, because it can be really difficult um, to learn about small, specific issues. So giving you information, giving you resources telling you who to contact and what to do. I um, mean, it's also just so much, um, often so much easier to continue your work if you have the support. So I'd say research local environmental um, groups. I think that would probably be a great first step. But I am, I'm very excited that you um, wanna be an environmental activist. That's amazing. Okay, Team Vision and Team Perseverance, our group at Franklin Elementary. You guys are up next. Why are polar bears so extinct? I know that it's because of the glaciers, but why? Yeah, of course. So um, that's a great question. Um, and so 
right now, because of global warming um, or climate change, which is the result of um, more emissions from, from different, um, if it's like cars or trains or companies or corporations producing things, um, you have more emissions of, of carbon. And so what that does is it, it traps, basically kind of traps heat in our atmosphere. Uh, and, and so it can't escape out or not as much of it can escape out. And so it's kind of just trapped within our atmosphere. And a lot of times what that does in Arctic places is it means it's getting warmer uh, pretty quickly than it, than it has been um, since like the polar bear has been around in this area. And so um, polar ice or, or, or Arctic ice is shrinking and there's less of it. And so what that means is um, typically how polar bears get their food is seals come up like out of the ice and that's how they eat is they eat the seals. Um, but now because there's less and less ice, seals basically aren't coming up where the polar bears are. And so they have less food to eat and they also have less area because polar bears need a large, very large area to survive and without other pair of polar bears nearby. And so the area where they can live that ice is shrinking each year and there's less and less ice. And so there's less and less area for them to live. Okay, let's move to Miss Van Hoy's group in Colorado. Um, how do you know what, wait, how do you know what needs to be fixed? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I am not an environmental scientist myself. Um, and so what, all that I can do is um, listen to researchers and scientists who are saying that these things are problem, that these things are a problem. But if you're saying like in your community, how do you know what's a problem like in your, like in your small community or, or large community, I'm not sure. Um, a lot of times reaching out to local resources, like I was saying, if you have like wildlife rangers or even if you have like a state um, um, parks and, and recreation office, um, that you can talk to them about issues in your community, uh, especially like wildlife issues. Um, but yeah, just listening to people who spend their lives and dedicate their lives to these issues. Um, and that's, that's what I try and do. Okay, last but not least, our fifth graders with Miss Monty. Your last question for Eve. Why is methane worse than carbon dioxide? Oh gosh, that's, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, you know, I am also not a chemist. Um, and so I'm, it, it has to do with the, the actual structure of methane and carbon um, and that the way they, they radiate or absorb um, heat basically. Um, I can't give you a super specific chemistry answer, um, but I do know that like different, um, different gases, methane or carbon or other kinds of like greenhouse gases do have different effects and have different amounts of like um, absorption or radiation um, of, of heat in your atmosphere. Okay, we're going to wrap up the Q&A with just um, one or two last questions here that came through from the website. Eve, I'm going to kind of combine two of them because they're kind of similar. So Ms. Vigil's fourth grade class in Colorado asked how they can convince their parents to bike to the store. And kind of along those same lines, Erin in Louisiana wanted to know what is the best way that um, young people can be heard? Yeah, those are those are great questions. Um, for convincing your parents to bike to the store, I would say one, it's a great way to get some exercise, which we all need. You can talk about that, um, or talk about um, one. It's like a great way, a great activity to do together. But it's also just good for the environment. You're reducing your um, your footprint by biking instead of taking the car, um, and that's like an amazing thing that we all we all should be aware of and trying to do um yeah I'm trying to think of like really good arguments for your parents because that can be kind of a hard thing to do I know <laughs> um but uh, the, the second part of the question how can young people be heard um is one you like taking the step to speak out because it, it can be scary and it can be difficult and it can be seem like it'd be way more fun to like 
maybe do something else. Um, and so first, just taking the step and doing that. And in terms of like how to do that, um, you know, making, you know, videos about things you're passionate about or writing letters to your representatives um, or people in your community that, that you're saying, I care about this issue um, and making posters in your community. But, but if, if you start speaking, I, I'm, I'm sure people will, people will listen. That's great advice, Eve. You just have to start speaking, right? Um, okay, so I think we're going to kind of bring things to a close here. So I want to thank all of you for watching and contributing questions and a huge special thanks to our groups that we had on camera. You guys did a great job. Huge thanks to Eve, of course, for sharing her experiences advocating for the environment up in Alaska and providing some insight on what we can all do to help. Before we go, I just want to share some information with everybody really quickly. Um, parents and teachers may find some of this helpful. So on the Conservation in the Classroom webpage where this video is streaming and where the recording will live afterwards, you can find some additional resources that kind of go along with Eve's presentation. One of which is a Kahoot trivia quiz. You just log into kahoot.it and enter the unique game pin code that you see there. Like I said, this is also on the web page, so don't feel like you have to write it down right now. You can always head over and get it on the website. There's also information on the Arctic um, and parts of Alaska, like what Eve was talking about, different threats facing the Arctic right now, and web stories, including an article on the next generation of environmental activists. If you guys had questions for Eve that we didn't have time to get to, you can always email them to the Wild Classroom email address, which is wildclassroom at wwfus.org, and we will do our best to get those questions over to Eve. I'm sure she'd be happy to get some answers back to you. And last but not least, go ahead and mark your calendars for our next event coming up on May 11th. We will be joined by Maria Jose Villanueva from WWF Mexico, who will introduce us to all of the colorful species like jaguars and sea turtles that travel across our border. So make sure to mark that down on your calendar. And last but not least, I want to wish everyone a very happy Earth Day. Thank you so much for joining us. Our on-camera groups, go ahead, unmute yourselves one last time and give a huge, huge thanks to Eve. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye. 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 Bye.